Welcome home. We are WNST, AM 1570, Taos in Baltimore. Baltimore positive. Uh, I would pull my Maryland lottery tickets out and promote the crab cake tour and all of those things we're going to be doing next month as Luke gets ready for baseball season. We get ready for a new owner. We got all this stuff going on, but I stop everything for rock and roll, especially when they're not playing football games right now and there's no March Madness to be mad about or any of that. Uh, I would love to tell you that this segment came about honestly, but it really came about because of um, Blondell Miller Schuler and Todd Schuler, uh, our dear friend here. Uh, I went to Las Vegas in um, in early November to see you two at the Sphere, and uh, took some pictures, put some stuff up, and Todd Schuler uh, commented, and and I had a little comment about the album Octung Baby. Or I I offered an official apology to John Keller, uh, my high school chum, because I didn't love Octung Baby when it came out. Sort of went through some phases with Zuropa and Zoo TV and squeezing lemons and satellite dishes and stuff. Then I fell back in love with you two and it was all good. We traveled the world together. We had beautiful music together in several continents. But I went to Las Vegas and uh, on that night, I apologized because I... Um, I had some u 2 isms and some so cruels and some ultraviolets and stuff like that, but just basically apologized. And on my thread, Todd Schuler said, and and I quote, Octung baby is the Joshua tree plus violator quoted by Rob Harvilla. And I said, well, this Rob Harvilla fella is a fella I need to get to know. Of course, I'm familiar with his work at the ringer. He is a Clevelandite and a, uh, I guess a Buckeye and, a, and an Ohio, but not really. All you Ohio people stick together except when you vote. Please go the right way this time. Uh, Rob Arvella joins us from The Ringer, and uh, he writes books about the 90s and 90s music. Dude, I, I let my hair out for this. This better be good. It's, you look, you, it's wonderful flowing locks. You know, it's, it's a great honor to me to, to, to see this hair, if, if this is a rare occasion for you. I'm jealous that you saw that you went to the Sphere. I did not go. My parents went. And told me all about it, but I did not have the pleasure of seeing the sphere in person myself. And so you know that, that worked for you in the end. You enjoyed yourself. Well, a guy's doing a biopic on me, so I'm kind of like looking through all these old pictures and this crazy stuff after 25 years of doing this. You must have really cool sure. parents. You just threw your parents in, and I'm like, you. I've been looking at pictures of my my parents. Uh, my parents camped out for ACDC tickets for us on the for those about the rock tour. Got That's us tickets. Cool. So, so I was a music critic in the 1980s when I was 15 years old. I had yeah. a um, editor at the Baltimore Sun said, do you know who Steven Tyler is here? Take some calls. And next thing there you know, I'm like three, 400 bylines deep into being yeah. my own version of Almost Famous. And all these <laughs> years later, guys like you are really doing it. I went on to sports radio, Super Bowl. You know, all I really, yeah. really wanted to do was write another Fast Times. You know what I mean? I just wanted to be <laughs> the, the guy with Rolling yeah. Stone. And you're that guy. And I... Uh, you know, I admire well, what you do for music, brother. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. When I was a teenager, all I wanted to do was write for Rolling Stone. That's I went to I applied to one college here in Ohio because it was a good journalism program because I wanted to write for Rolling Stone. That was my stated ambition. I never quite made it there, you know, close enough. I think everything worked out for the best. And I still I get to talk about the Smashing Pumpkins for money, you know, now. And that's that's a pretty cool thing in and of itself. I got a rejection letter once from Rolling Stone. Ooh, that's an honor. 90, Did you frame it or it was kind of cool. All right, yeah. No, I have it in a box. I, I wouldn't trust it in a frame. It's got to be in a box, man, you know? Yeah, I guess so. You got to preserve preserve that for your archives, you know, when you when you give that to, to Princeton, you know, a couple decades from now. What did your They're parents think of it. your ambitions to basically be Cameron Crowe? Man, they were into it. They were very supportive and they were very kind about it. And I'm so grateful about that in retrospect. Certainly majoring in magazine journalism in 1996 is a very intense, you know, severe choice. It's like that's not something that you can do now. I imagine, you know, I imagine that they, my parents had a lot of trepidation about going into journalism, you know, and about trying to write about music for a career, but they were all, they were supportive. Like I went, I remember so vividly in high school, I went to like a summer writing workshop that concluded after a week with like everybody reading their poetry, you know, that they'd written. And it was all this super angsty, you know, moping were any trucks poetry. involved. I just need to ask. No, yes, that's no, how okay. uncool it was. That's how uncool an okay. environment this was, that it was just everybody, you know, just reading Tom Robbins, 
you know, and being sad, you know, and not hooking up with each other, or at least I wasn't. But like my parents sat there for two hours and listened to a bunch of teenagers, you know, emote, you know, including me. And I just I was so grateful to them in that moment for how supportive they were just being there. So, I, you know, I they are responsible for me still being around and still doing this for better or for worse, hopefully for better. But I'm very grateful nonetheless. Anybody that knows my journey knows about my sports thing. And, you know, growing up with the Colts mm -hmm. here, we lost the Colts and the Mayflower. I did sports radio yeah. here pretty capably for about three decades uh, through all of it, all the Cal, all the Ray Lewis, all the, like all that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, sports became like a vocation for me and like the thing sure. I had to do to pay my bills. Love it. No more. I've forgotten more about sports than any, but rock and <laughs> roll makes my blood pump. And I'm right. 55 years old. You know what I mean? Okay. So sure. uh, I, and it's the one thing I'm surrounded by Pacifica belt buckles. It's the one I don't collect baseball cards, although I did 40 years ago. I have like a super tramp and a Van Halen and a Bee Gees belt mm. buckle. So I'm more of the disco meets Zeppelin Totally hairspray. 70s. Everything about poison, 70s. everything about yeah. guns and roses. 70s yeah. and into the 80s, I yeah. could be the you of that. We also we have Mike Brillhart to do that here in Baltimore on 100.7, who's my buddy from Hammer. I was the Hammerjacks backstage guy. So, like, okay. that's my era, right? And lame. then it all – I mean, I'm not – Literally, I'm not BSing you. So I worked at the paper from 84 to 86 and 86 to 92. 1992, okay. I left Camden Yards opened in Baltimore. There right? it My is. last name's Aparicio. And yep. I never really wrote another music story after writing probably 500 on every right. genre you could possibly, every rock star, 100 yeah. Hall of Famers. And it's sure. cold turkey in 1991-92. And it's right when Nirvana and Pearl Jam and it stepped in. And, and I yes. still loved music. I was still a Hootie and the Blowfish guy and like of all of that gin block, like all of that. But I didn't yeah. do it from uh, chasing somebody at Polygram trying to get an interview and going back. <laughs> like I didn't do it. It was cold turkey. It was all Mike Messina, Cal Ripken football after that. But I've been going to concerts and it's my thing. I travel the world for concerts. It's taken yeah. me to Australia to see Bruce. It's taken me to Europe. Like, mm. But your 90s thing is just – um, fascinating to me because I didn't interact with music journalism in the nineties. I just interacted with the music. So seeing sure. your thoughts about how it all melded together when you were my age, when all of this other stuff happened, it really mm -hmm. is generational, right? And whatever music totally. you listen to your 18, it's yours for life. And then you've chronicled it all these years later. That's what I've come to realize is the music you love as a teenager is the music that's going to be most important for you. And like hearing Nirvana at 13, you know, versus hearing Nirvana at like 23 or hearing Nirvana at 13, like 20 years later. Right. Like it's cool now that teenagers now are still getting into Nirvana or at least still wearing the T-shirts. Right. But there there is no replacing the real time experience of, I was like you. I grew up on MTV, on 80s MTV. I loved, you know, hair metal, you know, and it's not that I stopped loving hair metal the moment, you know, the Smells Like Teen Spirit video premiered for the first time. But I totally, as a teenager, bought into that narrative that like grunge killed hair metal, right? You know, and like Guns N' Roses. It, but it did. Yeah, it, it felt like if you were watching MTV, it certainly did. But just going from Guns N' Roses being the biggest band on earth you know, in 1990 to Nirvana being the biggest band on earth in 1992, like that whiplash effect coinciding with the whiplash experience of being a teenager. Like there's just, there's no replacing or replicating that, you know, whether you were born earlier or later. Well, to him being dead three years later and the Foo Fighters still right. being this extension right. in the way Wings was to the Beatles, to the, you know, to whatever. Yeah, the Wings. Of, well, yeah. Yeah, listen, I got to go back to the original quote. This is how you, I mean, literally how you wound up on the show. I, Violator and Joshua Tree are probably for me, if I got on an island and I only had 10, they would be two the of the 10. Island. All right. It, that, no. that, they would Good be choices. two of my 10. Yes. Excellent choices. That's legit. So how did the Octung Baby reference happen? I, I I need to know this. Well, U2 is an interesting, like I grew up listening to U2 and in the 80s, 
you know, U2 meant, you know, Heartlands Arena Rock, right? Like I, you know, the Joshua Tree, Unforgettable Fire, like that's where I got into them. And my mom and my mom's brothers loved U2. Like my mom took me to see the Zoo TV tour, you know, the Octoon Baby tour. It's your mom's 19- U2 is probably my U2, which is like sort of Bono on a barge and <laughs> rain falling at Red Rocks, uh-huh. right? That's like, right. Yes. Right? Yeah. But I, it, so it's interesting the experience U2 feels like a different band in the 90s and like Octo and Baby is a is a like a classic you sort of universally agreed upon like Joshua Tree and Octo and Baby I think are of a piece as their peak for a lot of people not everybody but a lot of people but I do have a lot of you know I, I there's a lot of charisma to later to 90s U2 when they get a little shaky when they go a little too far with like irony and dance music and like MTV and like image making you know, Zuropa and Pop are like very weird records, you know, sort of uncomfortable, sort of awkward, but in a way that's really endearing for me. But something that I love about U2 is that they have these eras, you know, they have these eras for me personally, like what stage of my life I was in, but, you know, from like up and coming, you know, like punk rockers, like post-punk rockers, you know, as into Joy Division as anything else to like on top of the world from the Joshua Tree forward, you know, to like in this weird sort of ironic dead zone where they're not quite the cool thing anymore, but they're still really, really trying by the mid nineties. Like it's it's cool to me how many different eras of U2 there are now. I think for bands that survived that period of time, and I'm thinking of like Rush, cause I'm a Rush guy, but bands totally. that really, it, the beginning, the middle, and the end were very, mm-hmm. very different books, very, right. very different sounds, different instruments, different voices, just different everything mm-hmm. with the right. same artists, right? Like yes. no, no other different pieces where like Clapton played with everybody and Ronnie Wood played with everybody. Yeah, yeah, and you move around from band to band. These are the same humans just right. being in the different – Look, I saw Sting with the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra on Friday night with my wife. Made her very, very happy. My wife loved that, right? I have seen Sting now in the Synchronicity Tour at the Capitol Center with REM in 1983. I've seen them in stadiums. REM? You saw the police in REM? REM opened up for the police on the the 83 tour. Synchronicity. Yeah, you can look that one up. I'm jealous of that. I would have have seen that. Yeah. Yeah, but so like, uh, like I saw all these eras, and REM's another band, and they broke up and just said we're done and we're out. And Mike Mills is playing with orchestras now down in Atlanta, right? Th- right. There's a period for your music where, you, you know, your people aren't as old as like me. You know what I mean? Like I'm very <laughs> interested to see what the Green Days and what, mm. I mean, some of the '90s artists are leaving us as well. But like right. the the next chapter, to your point of. What does come next for some of these artists that are John Mayer evolving, always evolving, right? Right. Now he's in the 80s. John Mayer is somehow evolving. You know, John Mayer is becoming dad rock in real time. But John Mayer is also, you know, a part of the Grateful Dead extended universe. You know, yeah, John Mayer is a fascinating case. You know, there's the Dave Chappelle era. You know, there's sort of the heartthrob era. You know, there's the bad boy era. There's the sort of fake country, you know, you know, Cormac McCarthy era. And yeah, it's yeah. John I love the a, sob a, rock era, if that matters. I mean, he took a hell oh, of a band. I love, last year. Yeah, that's a great record. That's a really cool record. And it's cool because it's like a guy from the early 2000s who's reminding me of the 80s. You know, but now it's, you know, go listen to Clapton's years. journeyman and you like right into that groove with the same. Right. Groove it's right awesome, there. dude legit i saw that tour and i really 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 dug that a lot yeah i saw the tour too and i saw it weird because like i was at the garden the night everybody got covid so he just came out and played on it (laughs) (laughs) quest love came in like an uber and saved his ass and they got up and they're doing vultures rob arville is here i've waited well only since the 90s not a whole lifetime only a half a lifetime to have him on tell everybody what the ringer is just in case they don't know (laughs) and um you know like like it's a little bit of everything now isn't it yeah well it's sports and pop culture that's what it is the ringer is a website you know started by bill simmons you know the very famous sports writer you know culture writer podcaster bill simmons so it's a website and it's also a pretty healthy pretty robust podcast network you know where it's it's not 50 50 right but it's like half sports 
you know, half culture. And I am for sure on the culture side, on the music side. You know, I've had this podcast I've been doing since 2020. You know, I'm coming to it pretty late. The Ringer's been around since 2016. You know, there, there was a site called Grantland. It was an extension of ESPN. That was sort of Bill's first big thing. But yeah, it's just, it's the combination of sports and pop culture, you know, the combination of a website, you know, and a podcast network. You know, we do documentaries through HBO. We got a lot of stuff happening, but I'm just hanging out here in Ohio, just trying to keep my head down, you know, and just doing my little stories about you two and whatnot. I'm having a great time. Here's something that gets me to be an old guy. We'll, we'll mm-hmm. do two topics here. Um, festivals in general, <laughs> just like festivals, right? Where like uh-huh. you can't piss, you can't get in, the, you're weather related. Yeah. I don't want to be a get off my lawn guy, but it's not necessarily the way I want to experience music, of right? And is. I don't yeah. need to be up on top of it. Or, but it feels like these festivals, I don't do most of them. I mean, it would take... I mean, it, if the weather were perfect in Ocean City last year, Cheryl Crow, they they would it, Dave, it would have gotten me. But the weather wasn't, you know, it doesn't need to be seventy two and sunny, but it just right. needs to be comfortable to be out twelve hours. I don't do rain and cold, so that is one topic. And the other one is etiquette, and one sort of leads to the other because festivals are a party and whatever and whatever lawn seats. Yeah. I am so effing frustrated. With spending a lot of money, I had eight of the nastiest, drunkest 55-year-old women yelling at me at a Toto concert, Rob Harvilla. Toto? They were screaming at me during ballads. I don't understand, like... Get a different draw, get a different but but people on? just people who talk during concerts. No, like, I hate that. Can we fix no. this, man? You have we clout, can't. dude. You have street. Do cred. I? I yes. don't know that I do. I can't make the ladies at the Toto concert shut up if that's what you're asking me. I don't have that sort of authority. I can commiserate with you. You know, I can share in your sorrows. I'm too old to go to festivals, you know, partly this is a child's rearing situation like i don't i can't leave this house basically and so i'm not you're not going to see me at coachella or whatever but i'm like you like i'm not going unless the weather is perfect and i have a chair you know and i am a certain you know pretty short distance from the stage like i'm just not doing it but no like people talking during concerts you know it's a terrible curse you know you should be able to spray them with a hose or something but i Toto, though like just this conflict transpiring while toto is on stage is that's a lot of discord for me to process it happens in every city in every show it happened at a symphony hall during sting the other night it happens when john mayer is singing comfortable and you Mm. can't shut up you know for the one three times on the tour he does it rob arville is here he writes books all right let's talk about your book because the 90s and i this whole thing began with me in the 70s and 80s and i'll read a zeppelin book i'll read books on my bands you however have sort of taken on the whole genre of anything that was written during that period of time and finding mm-hmm. sort of a modern place for all of it. Yeah. I, it's, I was a teenager in the nineties, right? I went to high school. I went to college and this is the music that imprinted on me. You know, there's an inherent nostalgic quality to me writing a book about the nineties now. Right. But I do think that a lot of this music is still present tense You know, I still think people, young people even, are still listening to it. And the music being made now by young people is still influenced by it. You know, and I'm curious about the difference between Nirvana as I experienced them as a 13-year-old in 1991 versus, like, the, the myth of Nirvana now, right? Like, somebody, a kid, a teenager now who buys a Nirvana t-shirt in Target, or whatever, or their parents buy it for them. Like, what does that band mean to them versus what that band meant to me at the time? I'm sort of interested in in sort of interrogating the difference between the myth and reality of the 90s themselves. But I do think that the 90s as a culture, as a decade, you know, as a period, as an e- epoch or whatever, like it does hang together. It does feel coherent. You know, it does feel distinct in a way different. You know, I don't, think about the 2000s or the 2010s the same way i think that we have a a better defined culture and i'm trying to figure out if that's just because i was a teenager at the time or whether i'm on to something there does that make the foo fighters the wings of the beatles to to someone younger about that 
Because I, I, mean, I, I listen, I have memories in 1976 or with my dad. Now, my first thanks. 45 was got to get you into my life. Wow. Flipside Helter Skelter, right? Very, I also my geez, other that's cool. Yeah. The other three were a Starland vocal band, uh, Afternoon Delight, and yeah. this is before Will Ferrell. And sure. uh, the other one was Neil Diamond, if you know what I mean. So this is 1973-74, and cool I kid. then heard "Let Him In," the the wing song. Someone's knocking on the door, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And silly love songs. And it didn't equate to me that Paul Mc... I mean, I'm eight years old, I'm nine years old, right? So it didn't equate right. to me that one's the other. Once one sure. became the other, he became Paul McCartney and he became, and there's Lennon and Candlestick and, you know, Ed Sullivan and all that. But I totally. think there's a point where if you're a 13 year old kid and you're, you're at Target and the happy <laughs> face of Nirvana, the same one that I bought <laughs> at, That's uh, right. when he played American University that night, I saw him there at Bender Arena. Um, I'm jealous again. All right. right. You know, I mean, I lived, I'm just older, dude. I'm just older, you know, <laughs> so it's, I'm just older. That's all there is. I saw Sean Cassidy in his prime too, but we don't talk hey. about that here, you know. All right. We okay, don't talk let's about not. that. <laughs> but, but I, I, I do wonder for a 13 year old where I had WLPL, I had it all. Every one of these belt buckles was predetermined by me from Saturday night fever through the disco yeah. era, through your experience with MTV, where everything was sort of funneled at mm -hmm. you to some degree. And then radio yep. went away or is going away or on, it was well on its way to be going away and Napster and all that young mm -hmm. people. Now, when they see, um, I, I mean, I, any young band there is do a lip, you know, pick anything that's sort of a new thing to say where they're, where they find that on their journey. And the Taylor Swift thing is just beyond Beatles and Elvis to me in the modern era. Right. So it's still, sure. it's still sitting there for bands, but I think it's so much harder to latch on to something. Yeah, I mean, nobody sells as many records anymore, you know, as they did in the 80s and the 90s. You know, I was thinking about, you know, Taylor Swift is probably the biggest cultural phenomenon, musical phenomenon since probably Michael Jackson at this point, you know, but the, like how huge Michael Jackson loomed over me, you know, in 1984 when I was six years old. I've never had that feeling again, even with her, you know, and so it's it's sort of an easy shorthand to say that partly because of the Internet, right? Like the culture is scattered now. You know, there isn't a monoculture. We're not all watching the same TV shows. We're not all watching the same movies. Like everybody's picking their own, you know, everyone's got their own algorithm, their own bubble. They're into their own thing, you know, and there are far fewer intersection points than there were in 1992 or 1982, you know, and I think that's mostly a good thing versus a bad thing you know my kids having the choice to get into anything and not having to pay twenty dollars you know to buy you know a 30 minute cd like that's a great thing that they can do anything that they want but it does lead to this scattered scatterbrain sort of feel where like it's the culture feels less distinct now than it did when i can just very blithely summarize the 80s as michael jackson now like you can't do that so much in this era even if maybe taylor swift is proving us wrong my wife just started that We Are the World doc the other night. I'm only 20 minutes into it. I don't want to see that. Don't let me know how it ends. That. I don't need to know how it ends. I mean, I know the song. It's fine. <laughs> Rob Arville is here from The Ringer. He writes books about the 90s. Um, I, I Every once in a while, I get a wild hair because people think of me for sports, and I've been known to opine about politics and whatnot. But every once in a while, let's put one line out. Like last week, I put – Air Supply or Little River Band, pick one. You know what I mean? Like, so I throw that sort of thing out, but I threw something okay. out about nine months ago <laughs> that created like a really long thread. And all I was really trying to do was like put together a playlist, like a mixtape, like we, we, sure. what people my age would call a mixtape. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, what's the greatest song ever written? What? Wow. Yowza. Right. <laughs> and you know the worst part, Dave Shinin, um, and you're in the sports world to some degree. Dave Shinin is a Washington sure. Post reporter. He's a musician. He's a beautiful guy. He does the theme song uh, for all my music at, here at Baltimore Positive. Dave came came on the thread and he wrote Stara. And I thought, I, I'm going to go back and listen to Fleetwood Mac. And I went back and I listened to Fleetwood Mac. I had him on the show two months ago. I grabbed my Fleetwood Mac uh, Pacifica belt buckle. I brought it out. He said, no, 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 the Bob Dylan, Sarah. And I'm like, come uh, on, I was man. Gonna say, come on, was, man. You know, so what's, Jefferson what's your, Starship what's your number Sarah. one? Come on. Give me greatest what's song the greatest ever. Greatest song ever written. Holy moly. Who's ever asked you that? 
No, not, I don't know if anyone ever has. Let me, okay, all right, okay, all right, all right, okay. It's always mood related, isn't it? It depends on what the lighting is and how you're feeling and, you know, whether you want to rock out or whether you want to be romantic, you know what I mean? Yeah. I have to. You get back to me? No, no, I, it's, it's, it feels like a niche thing for me, but I, Common People by Pulp immediately popped into my head as, in my opinion, one of the best written songs in any genre of all time, you know, and I can say that as a nineties guy or whatever, you know, but I, I think there is a quality and anthemic and sort of an articulate quality that that has where that's, that's one of the all time grades, you know, of course I wanted to jump right to like Prince or the Beatles or whoever. And that's probably objectively the right answer. But I, I think one thing that I love about the 90s is that there are songs that I do think stand, you know, with the ultimate pantheon. And I'm going to just sort of honor the first thing that popped into my head. And what are they then? Come people. on now, because you're always making these cases that the 90s were the greatest cross section. I can read from the back of the book cover now, Rob. You, you can. Know. You so, can. I know let, what it's So, <laughs> so pick, pick a few more. Pick a okay, few sure, more songs sure, sure. that I – because the reason I did this thing nine months ago and I got that Sarah thing wrong was just mm -hmm. to go back – you know what? The last time I had a music guest was about three weeks ago. I had Rick Emmett from Triumph on. And the Ooh. whole reason he wrote a book, the whole reason I had him on was someone on that thread wrote Magic Power. And I went back and I listened to it and I'm like, that's a effing Dope. great song. And okay. then six months later, I had him on. So that's why you're just giving me little nuggets here. I'll remember anything okay. you say. And Todd Schuler and Good. I – will remember this as gospel. So whatever you say, I'm going to add it to my playlist and, and reconsider the song. Well, geez, man. And I would have to think, as I said, Prince has to be, you know, probably, you know, is it just Prince like When Doves Cry or Kiss, you know, or Purple Rain, if you want to do that. There has to be a Prince song in there. You didn't you say know, that, did you? Because last week I tweeted out that I would die for you on any hill that Cream is Prince's best song. Wow, that's a great choice. That's a fantastic song, a 90s song. There you go. Cream. You know, I don't know if I would say the best song ever, but that's again, that's in the pantheon. I totally respect that opinion. Cream is a great song. You know, Beatles wise, I would probably go let it be. You know, I would, you know, like Missy Elliott's Work It, you know, is one of my favorite rap songs of all time, early 2000s. You know, I think that has to be then a greatest song of all time conversation like you two wise like you got to put something in there and and, and that's going to be again there are micro eras you could say with or without you you could say one you know you could say where the streets have no name you know like that might be it for me still um uh you know the first band i ever loved dude honestly was the cars that was the <laughs> first you know and so i you know I, that whole album really it's like just what I needed by the cars. Are you pulling out a car's belt buckle? Well, no, dude, you're I mean, something. come on, there it man. Is. You, yes. you know, like two. I, you asked, you two of you, them. I have three actually. I can't reach three. the other one right now. Yeah, the That's other one's a gold phenomenal. one. Yeah, oh, I'm holding How many it upside belt down. Belt buckles do you have? Well, total. I've never several. heard of this collecting several. <laughs> several. Yeah, I have several. Well, it all started. It actually all okay. started um, with my Led Zeppelin belt buckle that I bought at KB. Uh, toy okay. store in 1979 a, a and it's TV it's sort of the spread store. eagle um yeah. zeppelin eagle sure. thing and yeah. i own that belt buckle for 35 years and my wife okay. after my wife survived cancer the second time she was trying oh, to do something goodness. nice for christmas for me and she surprised me because i never had a belt to wear it on it was a standalone i was belt about to ask if never really owned that. I was never that okay. kind of belt guy. I wasn't that cool. Uh, I never had a jean jacket either, but don't cry for me. Um, so my wife saw, and she knows I love Rush. She went on the Rush website and they had remanufactured a modern version. And she bought me a belt and it was beautiful. I had two belts. And I'm out drinking wine one night with John Allen from the Charm City Devils, my childhood buddy. He sees the belt. He's like, hey, I got an Aerosmith one. I have a Zeppelin. What? And he said, I have a Stevie Wonder one. I'm like, you have a what? Ooh. So That's then we cool. we went on the internet, and then it cost me a lot of money. You know what I mean? Yeah, Actually, I was about this to was say. the first one I bought, dude. This this one was the first one that caught my eye. Literally, this was that the, is extremely this, cool. 
And so I lend it out to my buddy Ron West, who's in the in in the, in a band and um, yeah. the Cultivated. That, but they don't do just cult music. But I let I let him wear the belt buckle of his choice because they're cool and they're fun. So the cars, man, that cars. you you know like that's a great bass. If you love the cars, we can hang out. Like seriously. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Drive. I love the car song Drive. Also, that might be my favorite song of theirs overall. But that first Cars record was the first album I ever loved, you know, as a like a four or five year old. And so something from there has got to be in the all time pantheon. Oh. I don't have a belt buckle of them. I'm not about that life, apparently. But I got to. How get old were there. you when you saw Phoebe Cates get out of the pool in Fast Times? I just need to know. I was not late teens. Okay. I did not have that association with moving in stereo immediately. Well, <laughs> I mean, I certainly Once understand you had that it, I you was never lost it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I caught up fast, but I, I used to think that song was sung by Darth Vader just because it sounded, it had a Darth Vader sort of sound to it. So I did not come to that song the way I, uh, yeah. Never and that baseline hook. You know, so I'm going to leave yes. you with this because uh, Todd okay. Schuler is your biggest fan. He reads all your work and is a devotee. Awesome. Yeah, and he's yeah. a local lawyer, but don't hold that against him. He's a reformed I politician, but he was on the right side of the world and wants good causes and doesn't believe in insurrectionists and criminals. Um, he nice. wants me to ask you, this is Ask Rob, Ask Rob Harvilla. Great. Ask him how we're supposed to celebrate our first St. Patty's Day without Shane McGowan and Sinead uh, O'Connor. And the reason oh, I'm, I, I, right. I, I bring that right. in because the Prince song. Song, right nothing compares to you so when we yeah. think about great Prince songs we think of Sinead with that but that is a great Prince song it is a great Prince song but it's one of those cases you know I it's like respect right like Aretha Franklin stealing a song from Otis Redding you know I can appreciate the original version you know the original Prince version eventually we got to hear of nothing compares to you but what's so amazing about that is it's Sinead's song now, you know, as much as I love Prince and Revere Prince is one of the all timers, like that's a case where she owns that song, you know, and there's no greater accomplishment as a pop singer than to own a song from one of the greatest like Prince. And so, I, yeah, I had not I mean, made Kenny that Rogers like sort of owns Lady, even though Lionel Richie wrote it. Kind that's of right. It's right. very much like that. Yeah. And so no, you're absolutely right. You know. Obviously, Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberries has been gone a few years now, but no, this is a very different St. Patrick's Day for that reason. And I hadn't made that connection, but you, you, that's a tough one. That's a super tough one. You know, that was a, that was a both enormous losses. You know, but Sinead was was a wild. That was a wild story to go back and you know to read about and to read about like Saturday Night Live and just how how revolutionary she was, like you know, in real time. It was just just such a cool, really tragic, but still really honorable story. What's coming up on the podcast? Give, give me a little uh, preview here, and we'll let you get on your way. And uh, and I hope you come back, you know, once a year or something I'd like love that. To. We'll, we'll, we'll vibe Whatever, out. Stuff. Any guy that's got that stereo behind them still that I had, oh, that Marantz right. from like okay. '84. The Marantz, I Perfect. got this on eBay, dog. Yeah, all right. We could. I want to hear more about your belt buckle, so I'll be back absolutely for certain. Uh, as we speak, it's Monday uh, on Wednesday is the final episode of this show, the 120th and final episode of the inaccurately named, obviously, 60 songs that explain the 90s. You know, I, I felt like I could do this forever, but I felt like I should stop at some point. And so this is we're we're going to go on and do something else very soon. The show will be back. But as far as the 90s is concerned, the last episode is this week. And I'm you know, I need a break just just physically, you know, but I am very sad finally to be leaving this decade behind after like four years of my life. You know, you're not so leaving. Cool what, what else are you going to do? You're the it's 90s a good guy. Question. Own it's it, a dude. very good question. I, 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 cast I, I, now. I mean, be Bobby go. Brady for life. Own it. Wow. Put on the job. Okay. Own the 90s. People love you, man. They love you. <laughs> You've convinced me. Okay, so it's just another normal episode coming out on Wednesday, and I'll keep doing the show forever. You've absolutely convinced me. There, were, there. Listen, there's at the least sixty more songs for you to find, right? Oh, there I at mean, least, yeah. Oh, totally. I haven't done like the mighty, mighty boss tones yet, dude. You know, I, there's plenty left on the table that I'll get to now, thanks to you. When I found this radio station in 1998, the people that had it was a failed kids radio station. So we're celebrating Ooh. 25 years, right? They had Congrats. a loop tape and the mighty, mighty boss tones, the impression I got played every, because it was for kids that, you know, it had sort of that. Look, that children's, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, when I think of that, I think of this. 
And I will always think kindly of you. I appreciate your time and your your candor and your sense of humor. Everybody appreciates your work. I encourage everybody to go out and get the book, especially if you are a child of the 90s or even if you were like old enough to be like drinking beer and chasing girls in the 90s. It was still a good time to be listening to music. And when I hear Nirvana, even though you think one thing and I think another thing, we probably both think the same thing. It's pretty good, right? Pretty I mean, much. Rock and roll. It's pretty good, right, is a well, good way to summarize it. You know, soothe your mortal soul. And so uh, – Hey, take care of yourself, Rob. Thanks for coming on. All Thanks right? so much, dude. Rob Arvilla from The Ringer. He uh, does podcasts. He writes books. He is the 90s guy. Whether he wants to be or not, let's own it because it's awesome. <laughs> I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. Stick with us. We're going to get back to some Baltimore positive, talk some sports at some point. Why? Music's more fun anyway.